Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by eToro. <laughs> Discover a simpler way to trade and invest in cryptocurrencies and more. South Korea sends more shockwaves into an already nervous market. ICOs seem to be turning small investors into US dollar millionaires. And we continue with our interviews with industry leaders to see what they are expecting for crypto in 2018. Good evening, it's Thursday night and you're watching Crypto Trader, still the world's only televised cryptocurrency investment show. Rumors coming out of South Korea once again sent the market into a spin. This time it was a story that was broken by Reuters that claimed that the Justice Minister of South Korea said that cryptocurrency trading was like gambling and that he had a bill on his desk which would effectively ban trading in cryptocurrencies. That was followed by some unjustified reports that the larger exchanges in Korea were being raided by the South Korean authorities. Combine the two, sprinkle a bit of Western media and a loss of translation and you set yourself up for a perfect storm. We've been following the story quite closely from Korea. Our correspondent on the ground is Joseph Young. Joseph, where are we right now when it comes to trading cryptocurrency in South Korea? Right, um, in South Korea, there's a big mess uh, with the cryptocurrency regulations. Um, two days ago, the Justice Ministry uh, released a premature statement uh, saying that they will ban Bitcoin trading. And hours later, the Ministry of Strategy and Finance refuted that claim. And Hours later that, the Blue House, the executive uh, office of the president, issued a public apology saying that there will be no cryptocurrency trade ban. So there was massive volatility in the market over the past 48 hours. Joseph, as far as I understand, South Korea is not like North Korea. South Korea is much more of a democracy. It's pro-capitalism. And the government really does listen to the people. My understanding is that the government has set up an inter-ministerial task force to look at regulating crypto. And it doesn't make logical sense that if they set up a task force to regulate crypto, that they would come out with a ban. Are you aware of a task force that's out there to regulate crypto? Yes, uh, I have a quote from a task force spokesman. The task force is created by the Justice Ministry, the Ministry of Strategy and Finance, the Central Bank, Third Trade Commission, and four other agencies. And in December, the task force stated that they will follow the regulatory roadmap of Japan and the U.S., and other major regions. So the quote reads, the South Korean government has no other choice but to follow the regulatory frameworks and trends established by other leading governments. So that has been their stance since December of 2017. And that is still their stance. So that was exactly my understanding. Are you saying that the comments made by the justice minister were actually made in his personal capacity? So the Ministry of Justice, the ministry itself stated that the Justice Minister released an independent statement. They, they are currently saying that that statement did not and does not reflect the, the stance of the Justice Ministry. So they're not planning a ban. And that was what the Justice uh, Ministry is apologizing about right now, that they released a premature statement and that that was a personal opinion. Joseph, we had reports that the authorities, and in particular the tax authorities, raided some of the biggest exchanges, exchanges like Bitum, is there any truth to those allegations? I've seen some uh, Western media outlets reporting that it was a raid. It, w it was not a raid. It was uh, unannounced visits. So they were visiting exchanges like BitHub and Corbit about taxes and about other policies. But they are looking into one cryptocurrency exchange called CoinOne. And they're investigating into the exchange because they believe that it had committed some fraudulent operations. But apart from that specific case, South Korean exchanges were not raided. Give me some insight as to why there's such a big premium in Korea to buy crypto. So I personally have released a lot of statements and wrote a lot of, a lot of articles about how, how hard it is to, to take advantage of that premium. The premium is so high in South Korea because South Koreans can only purchase cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum on regulated exchanges in South Korea. So they cannot move money outside the country because of capital controls and Foreigners cannot bring money inside a country and buy Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies with it. So the premiums are there because the supply is really small, but the demand is rising. 
Is the man on the street talking about crypto? Is there mainstream adoption? That is what the South Korean prime minister is uh, concerned about. It's so mainstream at the moment. If you walk around a subway or if you're in a cafe, you'll, you'll notice that five out of 10 people are either talking about cryptocurrencies or, or trading cryptocurrencies on their mobile devices. You'll even see middle-aged uh, men, 50, 60-year-old uh, employees of companies just talking about blockchain and Ethereum casually. It's just a part of the casual life of South Koreans. Everyone is talking about Bitcoin. That was Joseph Yang, our man on the ground in South Korea. And it seems that after all of this, Reuters have since put their tail between their legs and published a new article to clarify this unnecessary FUD. Again, unnecessary FUD called by Western media and lost in translation. So with the FUD from South Korea behind us, we can carry on looking at 2018 and what the big names in crypto are calling for 2018. Ari Paul is the Chief Investment Officer of Block Tower Capital. Ari, compliments of the season. Uh, Happy New Year to you. How's it going at Block Tower Capital? Everything's going great. You know, we're trying to, to scale the firm to match the growth in the market. So Ari, 2017 was amazing for everyone. It made all of us look like superheroes. What are you looking for in 2018? Uh, well, you can't get a repeat of 2017. So in 2017, all of cryptocurrency network value went from 18 billion to over 600 billion. Uh, you know, a 30x increase, you're, you're just not going to see that again because that would bring us to around $20 trillion next year. Um, so I, I am bullish for 2018. I do think crypto ends higher, but it's not going to be quite as, uh, you know, quite as insane. So I, last year was the big Bitcoin run. And of course, the others followed. Ethereum followed, Ripple followed, IOTA followed. Now we're at a point where if you put your money into the altcoins, you're going to make a lot of money. And if you can get your hands onto the ICOs, then you're going to make a real whack of money. Where are we in this market cycle? So in, in cryptocurrency, there's been this repeated cycle where it, typically it's the pattern you just described. First, it's Bitcoin. Then it's other coins on Coinbase. Then it's kind of the medium quality coin or I'd say medium, medium size coins, things like Monero. Uh, and then it's kind of the, the, the penny stocks, if you will. Um, and it's just a recycling of profits, right? Someone gets rich on Bitcoin, they're looking for the next 10x, money flows everywhere. Um, you know, in, investors are looking for something that can grow faster than the Bitcoin. And then what happens usually is people start recycling those paper profits back into something they believe in a little more, like Bitcoin or Ether. And then uh, the cycle repeats. So I think we just kind of finished the cycle where we just finished, you know, we went through that entire phase. We had the junk rally with every kind of penny crypto uh, skyrocketing. Um, so now I think it's kind of time for the higher quality, larger projects to again take the lead. So Ari, is Block Tower Capital investing in these small tokens and looking for these 100x returns? We do, but less so than, than many people in the market. Um, one is just liquidity and scalability, right? So we need to be able to put capital to work. Um, the other is just us. My background is a little bit more trading. So we do definitely do some pre-ICO investing. We're a little bit more focused on uh, the larger liquid names. Are there any sectors in particular that you're looking out for in 2018? So same boring answer I always give. I, I still like privacy coins. Um, you know, decentralized exchanges, frankly, have been growing faster than I expected. So Zero X, for example, has they've done a phenomenal job. And I don't mean that in terms of price. I mean, in terms of the engineering and in terms of getting user uh, user growth. So, you know, we've seen this this kind of explosion in, in decentralized exchanges. Those continue to be interesting. Another key theme for me is atomic swaps. So the protocols that have, um, you know, really cutting edge engineering, um, I think they're going to continue to do well. And that's protocols like Decred and Vertcoin. Uh, Litecoin, of course, also has atomic swaps. Um, and those facilitate decent, like the ultimate decentralized exchange, which, which is, you know, um, exchange at the atomic swap level. Ari, I'm going to slow you down here for our viewers that are not technical. What exactly is an atomic swap? An atomic swap is a way to exchange value across two blockchains in a way that is cryptographically secure without any third party at all whatsoever. So it's a direct transfer between two blockchains. Yeah, I think another word for this is interoperability, moving tokens across blockchains. Many of our guests this year have been calling it as a big theme, and I take it that you're a bull in this theme as well? I am. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one of the really clear use cases, the ability to transfer value, because it's not just transferring value. It's not just trading a vert coin for a Litecoin. It also enables all sorts of other interesting things, because then you can use one blockchain as a settlement layer, another blockchain as a payment layer, maybe a third blockchain for smart contracts or more complex computation. It really enables you to get the best of all worlds. It enables you to combine the best features of multiple blockchains. 
Ari, you're a trader at heart, and last year we saw the launch of the first Bitcoin futures contracts. Have these futures contracts made any difference to the normal Bitcoin market? Uh, not right now. So when they first launched, the Bitcoin futures traded at a big premium. They were trading 10% over spot. Um, and they, they didn't trade, they traded very big volume for a new futures launch, but a small volume relative to the Bitcoin market. Um, now the futures are trading very much in line. So what's happening is market makers are quoting the futures around the spot market. So market makers are looking at where Bitcoin is on Bitfinex or GDAX or Gemini, and they're just quoting the futures. So what happens to Bitcoin in this market? Is it going to be like the stable store of value coin? So two things. Um, one, Bitcoin does have this meaningful lead as store of value, uh, among other things, because of the futures and because of the options. And uh, if and when an ETF launches, Bitcoin is almost certainly going to be the first uh, the first winner of that because of the futures. It's more likely that you're going to get an ETF that holds futures than that holds actual cryptocurrency. Um, so that's very meaningful for store value because that liquidity really matters. Um, the, the, the flip side of that, though, is Bitcoin is not a financial asset. It is a network that can hard fork. So one prediction I have is that both Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash are going to continue hard forking in ways that makes it complicated. Because if you buy a Bitcoin future, what does it settle to? Does it, so, so right now, if you buy it, uh, it, it, doesn't, it does not settle to Bitcoin plus all the hard forks. You're kind of foregoing the dividend of the hard forks. Ari, there's a thesis out there that says that when the masses are buying, it's time for correction. And, you know, I went out for dinner the other night and I was wearing a Bitcoin shirt. And when the waiter saw it, he gave me a 15 minute lecture as to why I should be buying Bitcoin. But on the other side of that, we haven't seen the institutional money behind Bitcoin yet. So how do you see it? Are, are we setting ourselves up for, for a correction? I, I don't have a strong, I, 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 this is my mental framework for kind of where we are. It's very, I, I think that we're following a pattern fairly similar to the, the 90s tech boom, where I think we're in something like 1998 right now. So we may have a meaningful correction that's a 50, 60, 70% correction. But to me, that's just a correction in a bull market. It's not that, obviously as a trader it matters, but it doesn't matter that much. If you have a one year horizon, I mean, just in mid September, Bitcoin was $3,000. We fell from 5,000 to 3,000 then we were making new all time highs three weeks later. So if you have a horizon of six months, those corrections don't really matter. Um, eventually, I think there'll be a much, much steeper crash, like a 2000 crash. I don't think we're close to that yet. I think that's probably gonna be caused by regulation as crypto actually starts threatening central banks and governments. But right now, um, the, the concern, I guess, is that retail money is flooding in, partly in anticipation of institutional money. And the institutional money, as always, is a little slower than people expect. You are a trading master. You see trading opportunities where others see coincidences. Charts and patterns are everywhere. You can run with the bulls or be at one with the bears. So, don't waste another pip and take your talents to eToro. See why so many top traders choose us as their main trading platform. Start trading on eToro today. Next up, we've got one of the smartest people in crypto today. Carl Samani is the co-founder of Multicoin Capital. Carl, you always take a, a deeper look into things and I know tonight's going to be no different. What themes are you and Multicoin Capital looking out for in 2018? Yeah, so in 2018, we're really keeping our eyes on capital flows coming into the ecosystem. There's obviously a lot of noise going on in the markets today. Um, we we don't try to spend too much time tracking the like idiosyncratic runs or dips in any particular asset. Um, it's just it's too hard to track that. Rather, what we spend a lot of energy on today is aggregate capital flows in the crypto. Um, the other major thing we're thinking about today is, is major risk of systemic shock and uh, constructing a portfolio to be resilient in the event of systemic shock. So Carl, let's break that down into two distinct concepts. Uh, first, you talk about capital inflow into the market. What are your data points that you're looking at and where are you finding these data points? There's no aggregate single point where you can go to to say how many net new dollars, euros, whatever, you know, uh, float into crypto in the last 30 days. That, that does not exist as a single data point anywhere. Um, it's, it, what we try and do is we try and approximate that as best we can using as many kind of proxy points and anecdotal data points as we can find. So we look at a lot of things like exchange volumes, exchange new users, App Store analytics, these kinds of metrics, uh, looking at what kind of OTC desks, looking at these kinds of data points and figuring out 
um, you know, how much money is entering, and then even more importantly than how much money is entering, um, what is the aggregate rate of new capital flow? Is it accelerating or decelerating from where it was? What are you finding here? Are you seeing that there's more money flowing into the market? And is the institutional money actually flowing into the market? I can tell you today, capital is definitely accelerating into crypto. That means that we can expect to run for a while, but when does this run end? Yeah, making a prediction on that is, is impossible, projecting out. Uh, I, you know, Based on what we're seeing now, I think it's pretty safe to say that we'll see continued acceleration through Q1. Projecting further than Q1 at this point uh, seems uh, premature. And is the institutional money in crypto? Yes, there is. As a percentage, what percentage of the money do you think is institutional? Uh, I, I don't have a strong sense for how much is institutional. I, I mean, we, for example, uh, I think Bill Miller, he's a famous hedge fund manager in New York. He said that they would have a billion dollars in the Bitcoin at some point in, I'm going to guess, Q4 of 2017, so the latter part of 17. Um, if you count him as institutional, like then there's some of that. I don't know how many Bill Millers there are, and I don't know how much they've, they've all, each put in. Okay, what about systemic shock? I'm assuming that when you talk about systemic shock, you mean regulation. That's one of two major sources of systemic shock that we currently are, are trying to understand, yes. What's the other one? Uh, exchange explosion. When you talk about exchange explosion, are you talking about exchanges imploding on volume, or are you talking about another hack? Uh, a hack, and anything. It doesn't really matter what causes the exchange to fall, whether it's, it's Tether and Bitfinex, whether it's Coinbase attack. I mean, it could be even Zappo. That seems very unlikely, but like any black swan at any of the major um, honeypots of capital could really cause the dominant, you know, could cause the bubble pop. Okay, let's go back to regulation. What are you expecting from the regulators in 2018? So we don't have strong conviction. I can comment on what we've seen and break it down on a country by country basis. There's about four major jurisdictions that, that matter. Um, the United States, China, South Korea, and Japan. Um, so if you look at the US today, the SEC said very clearly in July that Bitcoin and Ether are not securities. That also implies Bitcoin Cash, Monero are also definitely not securities. So we can, we can start with those. Uh, the areas where you know, the SEC may choose to crack down are on um, the pre you know, ICOs that are, are unregistered securities and or scams and frauds. We've definitely seen them already cracking down on scams and frauds. We expect that to continue. Um, they seem to be taking a pretty lenient view of what is a, a utility token. Um, it's not clear how long that will persist or not, but certainly in terms of the, the big cap coins, uh, we, we feel pretty good about the, those. Um, the other kind of point of leverage for the SEC are the exchanges. Uh, we expect that if the SEC goes after the exchanges, they're going to primarily delist utility, you know, clearly ICO tokens that are you know, securities or debatably securities. So as fund managers, what is your portfolio strategy like in an environment like this? So the way we think about portfolio construction today is, you know, ride, ride your way up and try not to get too, too caught on the way down. So we spend a lot more time managing against risks that never end up manifesting. Um, and we'll just ride the market kind of in aggregate and, and construct our portfolio to mitigate these risks. And also to try and uh, take some risk off, you know, take some capital off the table as capital starts to decelerate. These days, it seems as if most investors are caught up in the hype of trading tokens. To me though, it seems the smart money must be working somewhere in the background, identifying trends and investing in companies that are gonna disrupt even the blockchain. Now, one of the most successful companies in this game is a company called DCG or the Digital Currency Group. And I've got their vice president of development on the line. Melton Demiris, you've been with the company since 2013. At the risk of calling you an OG, you've seen it all. You know, I would hope to think so. And what's been amazing is I work with our 110 portfolio companies. And so a lot of the businesses we invested in early on are what I call businesses that were sort of more on the infrastructure side. So it's people building new protocols, people building new ways to access the Bitcoin protocol. So wallets, security services, exchanges. And that was really like gen one of VC backed Bitcoin companies. Then from there, um, we evolved into uh, payments companies. So we really needed to invest in all of the exchanges around the world that were building this global Bitcoin network before we could have payment companies that were connecting those exchanges together to create new global payment rails. So once we invested in exchanges like BTCC in China, Corbit in Korea, um, Bitpagos, now Ripio in Argentina, um, Coinbase in the US, Kraken, we've now invested in over 20 in all of the places around the world, Australia, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then payments companies emerged, companies like um, Abra, 
which many people have heard of. It's kind of like Uber for cash. Um, companies like Veeam or Wire that enable SME or merchant payments, um, leveraging the Bitcoin payment rail. And then that was sort of 2013 to 2015. And then at the end of 2015, we started seeing a lot of attention being drawn to, well, can we do blockchain, the software underneath Bitcoin? but use it without this Bitcoin thing. And so from late 2015 till about 2017, we invested quite heavily in blockchain applications that focused on identity and compliance, that focused on creating global registries for different type of assets. And then a lot of companies that were building applications specific to enterprises that wanted to leverage blockchain. So that's sort of been our investment focus. And then this year, obviously, tokens and new protocols being bootstrapped through tokens have been a major area of focus. And while we've invested quite selectively there, I think tokenization is one of those trends that we see as a very important one going into 2018. What does the future look like though? What are you guys looking out for in 2018? Yeah, so I think there are three main areas where I'm certainly spending a lot of my time and what I think we're very excited about as a firm. The first is institutional infrastructure. So digital currencies are becoming a global asset class that is drawing attention from not just retail investors or the types of individuals who would use a Coinbase or in South Africa, a Luno, um, but it's really drawing attention from major global financial institutions like Goldman Sachs, Credit, uh, Credit Suisse, First Strand, again in South Africa. And so I think what we're excited about is investing in companies like Omniex, which is an institutional exchange platform. That's great. What other sectors are you guys looking at? Okay, so the second thing I'm really excited about is decentralized infrastructure. So if institutional is all about centralization and risk management, I think the idea of digital currencies at its heart was truly about removing intermediaries in transactions. And so we just invested in a company called Radar Relay. It's a decentralized exchange built on top of the 0x protocol. And I've actually been using Radar Relay a bit. And it's really cool because the order book is totally decentralized. And so essentially what it is, is it's an exchange that can never be shut down because it's just a piece of software that people run on their computers. So as you think about about regulators that are trying to look at how to regulate digital currency trading, um, one of the interesting ideas is, look, if you have a centralized exchange like a Coinbase, they can be shut down. But if you have a decentralized exchange that's simply a piece of software that people run, all of a sudden it becomes very difficult to limit the ability of individuals to participate in trading um, on these different protocols and with these different tokens. So very interested, not just in decentralized exchange, but broader architecture around decentralized financial systems and distributed computing. And then I would say the last area I'm really interested in is distributed web architecture. Malta, can I ask you, how big is your portfolio? How many companies have you guys actually invested in? Um, we've invested in 112 companies across 30 different countries. It seems as if ICOs are all the rage today. And if you were lucky enough to invest in some of the ICOs, you could have made, well, up to 200 times your money. Some people I know invested $20,000 into an ICO, and today, well, they're dollar millionaires. But how do you know which ones will work and which ones will fail? I've got Ian Bellino on the line from New Zealand, and pretty simply, Ian is the ICO man. Ian, a lot of money flowing into ICOs right now. Why is this happening? ICOs are the new bull market right now, right? And people who get into crypto are, are learning how much money people are making. They also know they missed the boat to Bitcoin, to Ethereum, and all, all these other great projects. So they're trying to catch the next rocket ship, right? So people are seeing new ICOs come out and seeing the big gains. For example, my, my community has seen lots of big gains in, in ICOs like Icon. I put 20 grand in Icon back in September, and in four months, it turned to over $1 million. So Icon has done over 100x, so has Wabi, so has uh, Dragon Chain is almost pushing 100x. So people are seeing these new ICOs and trying to find the next Bitcoin, the next Ethereum. And they feel like ICO investing is the way to catch that, right? Because they do, they feel like they're kind of late to the party. And they feel like if they get in at the ground floor and brand new projects, they can potentially see those same uh, ROI. Ian, there are a lot of scams out there right now, and if they're not scams, well, there's some ICOs that just aren't great ICOs. How do you know where to put your money? Me and my community apply data and analytics to figure out and filter out which ICOs are scams, which ICOs are bad, based on the ROI from the investor's perspective, right? So we call this token metrics. So we go through and look at the best ICOs of all time based on ROI, right? So ICOs like Ethereum, Neo, Stratus, we have about 25 ICOs or so, 
and we plot multiple data points, over 15 data points, both quantitative and qualitative data points, and figure out which data points matter the most in terms of ROI, right? And the answer is, is, is pretty obvious, but for someone who's brand new in cryptocurrency investing, it could, it's not so obvious all the time, right? So the, the best factor when it comes to picking an, an ICO is, do they have a prototype? Is there a product, right? Is there any kind of ship code, right? So that means if you're going through 40 ICOs every single day, because about 30 or 40 ICOs are happening every day now, right? You can quick, 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 quickly filter out the scams from those that have no actual product. And how would the average investor participate or get their hands onto the spreadsheet that you're using? So I share my spreadsheet, which I personally use to invest publicly. It's now become one of the most popular spreadsheets online, I think. Uh, so you can find that by going to ianbolina.com slash spreadsheet, where I go through and I just transparently share my analysis on each ICO I look at. Right. This is this comes from my community, from my audience, from my live streams. We go through and share and, pl and, and analyze every single ICO and put it publicly available on the spreadsheet for free. Ian, where would someone go to join your community? They can go to my Telegram by going to ianbalina.com slash mastermind. We have over 20,000 people going through ICOs, sharing their idea, their opinions, their analysis on each ICO. And this is what helps us not miss any ICO, no matter where it is across the world. Ian, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here today. Uh, what are the top five ICOs on your spreadsheet today? So my top ICOs right now, uh, so I like Go Network is a big one. Disclosure, I'm, I'm advising them. I also like Gems. Gems is a big one. I think right now there's a, uh, so I take community engagement into account when also evaluating ICOs. It's a, it's a particular data point I have as well. So Gems is a good one. Uh, I also like Nucleus Vision, which is what I'm advising. I like Buzel. Buzel is building very, very disruptive technology. Um, and I also like Orchid Protocol, which is one that's kind of under the radar. Um, they're raising mainly from funds, but it's one I think I'm very, very bullish on. I think it's going to do big things. That's all the time we have for tonight. Uh, I'm going to go get my hands onto the Ian Bellina spreadsheet to work out which ICO is paying for my brand new Lambo. If you haven't been following me on Twitter, now's a great time to start because uh, I've been tweeting live from the North America Bitcoin conference in Miami and I'm going to continue to tweet tomorrow. Next week, I'm back with another episode of the world's biggest crypto show. Until next week, my friends, bye the dip.